welcome to this very special edition of the kj masterclass live the show which ensures that you profit from your time spent here with experts either through their industry insights information or simply learning from them and today we have matthew snyder he is the president and co-founder of black tree strategy block three strategy group which exists to educate businesses brands and entrepreneurs how to leverage blockchain technologies to generate new channels of income welcome to the show matthew thank you so much aj great to be here you are welcome to the show you are welcome to india in this online form and i'm sure a lot of people not just in india but across the globe will want to understand from you about the strategy about generating passive income with digital uh, assets so first to understand from you what does your you know block three strategy group uh, do actually i have already said what i had in my understanding but i want to understand from you uh, for the audience so that nothing gets lost in translation Sure, sure. Uh, so Block3 Strategy Group is a company that I co-founded uh, last year, and it was born out of a company called NFT Consulting. So what we did was work with businesses, brands, uh, and entrepreneurs to learn how NFTs and digital assets could add new user experiences to their business, generate new channels of income, and you know just be part of this new Web3 ecosystem, which is uh, getting a lot of interesting traction as of late. Um, Block3 Strategy Group and myself are also registered investment advisors. So uh, we are able to provide investment advice in a world where people are always claiming that this isn't financial advice. We wanted to stand out and differentiate ourselves and be a fiduciary in this space. So um, we are uh, subject matter experts on investing both in traditional markets as well as the digital asset ecosystem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Matthew, so first to understand, you know, uh, in these times, from uh, when people are talking about all digital assets in this form, either in terms of cryptocurrency and all those things, from boom to bust, how are you dealing and telling people? Where are you? How are you getting these potential investors or potential clients in this in this particular line? What is the way you are convincing them? What is it that draws to them to this particular uh, asset class, in if you can say that, and so that you know there is a match, and then they can you know invest in the long term. How okay. how does it is it working right now on the ground? Yeah, I think one of the most important things for people to realize is that over the last ten years, even adding a one percent or two and a half percent or five percent allocation to digital assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum have outperformed traditional assets uh, or, or traditional portfolios like a traditional sixty forty portfolio. So first and foremost, it's kind of an interesting way to show them from a diversity perspective that they're able to diversify outside of their comfort zone just a small amount and benefit uh, significantly more. And so that's one really interesting way to do it. The other way is to show them some of the incoming catalysts for the ecosystem. We've had a depressed market for the past year or so, 18 months. So now prices are at a pretty good value considering where they were previously. You've got the incoming United States Bitcoin ETF, uh, spot Bitcoin ETF approval, which um, could be pretty imminent, whether it's this week or next week or before the end of the year. Um, in addition to other um, ETFs that might be coming as well, uh, the Bitcoin halving, which is going to be coming in April, will decrease the rewards from Bitcoin production uh, by half. So the increased demand from institutions and investors with a spot Bitcoin ETF matched with a uh, lowered supply of Bitcoin in sort of the macro sense of digital assets makes this a, a particularly compelling time to get involved in the space. And one of the other benefits is that the ecosystem is now more user friendly than it was maybe two years ago or five years ago when I was getting into the space. Um, so investors have a much easier way to get access to these digital assets than they did previously. And, and I think those tailwinds are certainly a big help to, to win investors over if they're still considering whether or not these are uh, options for them. Right. It, it... In this case, when you, you talked about, you know, the market was a bit depressed. Now, this depression was not like any other cyclical or any other reason. This had that those confidence issues. How are you answering questions 
regarding confidence back in this whole ecosystem, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, because a lot of steps have been taken either by, you know, government side. In India, if you see, we still have only one currency that is the, you know, Indian national rupee, no other currency, you know, crypto is just crypto, that's it. In so many other places, some countries have even, uh, you know, uh, tried with this system of, of uh, accepting it. How are you actually working things on the ground? Is it the greed part or is it people are finding it some sort of a viable uh, thing which got a bit of a bad name because of some uh, some few people? But actually, it's a good thing because the questions still remain. For example, they talked about Bitcoin or any of these uh, you know, cryptocurrencies was that this will help the lower 20%. But what about it? It, it was only talking about what the prices are in today's market. Even today, now nobody talks about the lower 20%. So has that uh, reasoning altogether gone? Now it is a new sort of a different, uh, different sort of a reasoning. I want to understand then what is the soul of this whole business? Is it only about because it is coming back into reckoning? Because something have happened, some few few news have come in. How is it then going to convince that it is something very going to be something there for the longer, you know, longer, long, it is going to be the longer version of the game? Sure, sure. I think looking at it from a macro perspective, Bitcoin and Ethereum are really your two biggest catalysts in that space. Yes, there's been a depression for maybe the past 18 months or so, but it was also followed by or prior prior was a, a pretty massive explosion of these of these cryptocurrencies mostly because of the introduction of nfts as a digital asset that could hold and store value uh, many didn't store value in that case but uh, it provided a flow of liquidity into the ecosystem back in 2016 2017 you had the proliferation of icos or initial coin offerings which were ways that platforms were essentially able to fund themselves kind of via a kickstarter or, or minor mini vc strategy um, and so when you see a lot of liquidity go into the ecosystem like that, people are going to put it into uh, higher risk uh, and higher, highly volatile assets that you know can move with it with the market in that sense. But I think one of the things that's important too is you know you look at the FTX scandal where you look at there's there's villains in the space that we need, and those villains are important because they just show you that fraud can't ever be combated against. You can't hedge or, 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 or protect against fraud. And that's what this was. And the same thing with Bernie Madoff in the United States, right? It doesn't matter if it's traditional securities or cryptocurrencies, what we need is more regulation to help people feel comfortable with these kinds of things. And there's issues in countries like in, I think India has banned it in some sense from like a, a trading perspective. China's done this a number of times, but overall you're gonna start to see more and more people finding mechanisms like this to get banked. There's over 2 billion people in this world that don't have a bank account because uh, either their governments are corrupt or they don't have access to credit or anything like that. And these digital assets provide that mechanism for people to sort of democratize banking and commerce with each other without the need for an intermediary or third party. And so there's a lot of this really interesting now ethos around we can do this together and it's not born of any particular nation. Right? It's not a, a, a creation of the United States. It's not a creation of uh, England or anything like that. So there's this there's this feeling that we're we're sort of saying. And, and from an investor perspective, you've got options in the United States that aren't that compelling. I can't go get a bunch of uh, appreciation and value from holding stocks when the stocks aren't doing very well. You've got a whole. You've got over a trillion dollars in credit card debt. The average credit card debt in the United States is six thousand dollars today. You've got lowered savings. You've got where are you going to put your money? And if you go put it in treasuries, you're going to get yourself 5%. But over the 15, 16 years that Bitcoin's been in existence, it's been about a 15 million percent increase in, in total price now being adopted by institutions, endowments and pension funds. Right, right, Matthew. Let's let's look at from an investor point of view. Uh, this sector, uh, if you can call it, has seen the good times. Mm -hmm. and the bad times mm -hmm. and for those people who have already made some money or waiting to make you know, in cash or uh, come out of this and make uh, with lots of money then is there room for others to get in and make that sort same sort of money how should they look at investment into 
you know, digital assets like this. How should they get started? Should they get started with investor perspective? Should they get started with a trader perspective to make, you know, it like a day trader to make as much money as possible? Should it be greed? Should it be long-term strategy? Because this, this sector itself is not very clear to a lot of people. I know nothing about it. Mm. And that is why I want, I would also like to understand how does a single, single, simple person get started into this and looking for something, you know, in the long run term or the short term, you would be the best person to tell that. Yeah, and that's that's a great, great question. And I think many people who are, one of the challenges is that this ecosystem came about with a lot of younger traders. You have the proliferation of applications like Robinhood, where you can trade options and you don't even need the licenses to do this. You can trade in and out of currencies, you can day trade, you can do all this kind of stuff. and younger people typically don't have the financial experience or the investing expertise to make really good decisions. So a lot of them do that greed in the day trading and I need to get Bitcoin here, Solana here and like buy, sell, buy, sell. Our portfolio has zero taxable transactions, meaning that we put our portfolio to work over 18 months ago and have completely left it alone because we are in it for the long term. And what we do is we go put those assets to work, either um, lending them or staking them for passive income. Uh, the rates were a bit higher, a little, a little, you know, maybe a year or so ago, which was good. But um, the, the truth is we don't trade. We just buy as much as we can and continue to hold and then, you know, take a little bit of interest here and there when, when you're able to do so. So for the average investor looking to get started, the key is to look at really, really basically just Bitcoin and Ethereum. Even if you don't even want to consider Ethereum, consider Bitcoin as the, the very initial way that you should kind of look at the iceberg. And you can really just do sort of a dollar cost averaging approach, which is a little bit of money every week or, or month. Um, I was just listening to um, a podcast today that was saying if you had dollar cost averaged and you bought the very top of Bitcoin and you had dollar cost average $100 a week since the very top to where we are now, you'd still be up 30%. So this is really, and from a Bitcoin perspective, the volatility has diminished over the last number of years. It's still volatile, but as more and more and more people get into the space, especially with the ETF and this, these new institutional investors, you're going to see that, that sort of parabolic volatility drop, and it's going to be a lot harder to move the market. So it's going to be easier for investors to say, okay, now's a good time to get in. I'm going to hold it for a number of years because there's only 21 million Bitcoin in existence. 19 million of them have already been mined through the miners and the proof of work ecosystem that we have. And you've got some people who've left hundreds of millions of dollars on servers that they can't remember the password to, and those tokens aren't in circulation anymore. So you've got an artificially, uh, I would say, scarce asset by design. And that is the, the impetus for why owning some of it as more and more people come into the ecosystem Rise the, raise the price. And so that's just something from a, a basic investing perspective that you should look at. Small entry, top tokens, long-term horizon. Right, right. But as they say, in invest, investment is that, you know, do not put all your eggs in the same basket. Exactly. What about that? Exactly. A hundred percent. And I think it's really important for people to consider that as they look at their risk profile, right? As an investment advisor, we look at what your goals are, what your risk profile is. If you've got a very solid portfolio and you really like where everything's going from a traditional perspective, fantastic. Don't necessarily need to touch it. But if you want to add a little bit of diversity, you can take one or two or 5% of your, uh, your total portfolio value, some of which should probably be in cash that you might have available to go buy some Bitcoin. Uh, and then just just add it to, to the diversity perspective. We are not in the position of saying you should put everything into Bitcoin or you should put everything into this ecosystem. But exposure to it has proven to outperform traditional portfolios, even with very small amounts. Right. So is, that is what I asked. In fact, that is putting into the basket of Bitcoin, whatever investment you are making in digital assets, will that be a good strategy in the going you know, short term, medium term or the long term? 
Yeah, I definitely think, uh, especially medium and long term, those are the those are the kind of views that you want to have. Again, we are not in the business of day trading or or putting these assets to work from a taxable tax and efficiency perspective. Uh, I don't think that that's particularly the the right way to go about it. But um, if you are if you are interested, there are um, like I said, it's it's just a matter of taking one or two or a small percentage of your overall portfolio and and putting it into these assets. Right. Then how do you de-risk yourself when you are putting money in, in, in only one, you know, say asset? How do you de-risk? Because that thing is left purely, and especially when you have no sovereign guarantee or any sort of a guarantee into this, if you can call it an emerging sector at all, maybe pe many people will disagree, a lot of people, so they will have. That is why I said, how do you de-risk yourself? You're just forget that, okay, this is the money. If I lose it, I lose it. Yeah, I think that there needs to be some, uh, there needs to be a little bit of an understanding that this, this could all wake up one day and go to zero. Like it, it, it absolutely could. You kind of have to, uh, as Elon Musk would say about AI, there's a non 0% chance that, that, that could happen, right? It's, there's a non 0% chance. However, there's a non 0% chance that the government could default on its debt. There's a non 0% chance that other assets or companies could also suffer similar fates. So from a de-risking perspective, one of the interesting kind of uh, unique flips about this is to say, let's go, let's go buy institutions like JP Morgan, let's go buy Bank of America, let's go buy Fidelity, because these are typically dividend paying stocks that don't have a ton of volatility, yet they are going to be the ones in charge of managing these ETFs. So you could, in a sense, have exposure to digital assets just by focusing on the institutions who are spending billions of dollars to bring in people from an ETF perspective. So that's kind of an interesting barbell strategy, right? You could put 90% of your, your assets in bank stocks that are really solid banks, institutions. Um, of course, if you ask me, maybe those are not in the best case when you had Silvergate and, and Silicon Valley Bank uh, earlier this year go through a complete collapse because of Interest rates, right? You've got a whole issue there with interest rates had nothing to do with crypto. So I think that's probably a really strong way of saying that's how you might want to de-risk in that sense. Right. The basic idea is to just be informed. In, be informed that this, this can be risky like any other, you know, investment in the stock market or anywhere else. Except that this is a new sort of investment and it can, uh, it can give you a lot of profit and it can sometimes go bust like any other stock like penny stock or whatever it is yeah. so let's let's move on for that in, sure. ter in terms of understanding the age profile earlier it was a lot of young investors mm -hmm. has that profile changed what are the type of you know what is the age group of people who are coming in into these digital assets definitely definitely younger uh people it definitely trends younger which i think is important because it's going to help frame the narrative of how we approach regulation and how we approach adoption for this. In the United States, we have people who are 80 plus years old running the running the country who, you know, don't know what a video game is, don't know what a digital asset is, can, you know, barely understand economics as it is in, in world macro situations. So having younger people involved in this, I think is really helpful. But I say what's really funny is that my dad calls me up and he's like, Oh, how's Bitcoin doing? Or my mom, you know, in 2017, she's like, this is a Ponzi scheme. And now she's saying, oh, Sam Bankman Freed got, you know, guilty on all charges. Like all of a sudden, my parents who are in their 60s and 70s are really interested in this. And my dad's got his own financial advisor who he always jokes about because he's like, oh, my son's involved in Web3 and crypto. And the financial advisor's like, I don't advise that yet, but I'm involved in it too. And I'm waiting for the day that my dad comes to me and he's like, the financial advisor finally came to us and said, OK, now you got a little bit of exposure because you have this ETF. So I think there's especially with the institutional investments, you're going to have things like pension funds and endowments, larger uh, treasuries now saying, OK, it's it's permission. We now have permission to do this because we've got a ton of other institutional investors involved. And uh, in some sense, it gets de risk that way. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh Coming on from there, what about the book you have written about, you know, with, uh, help us understand what is this book all about? Uh, why, why would Warren Buffett, yeah, help us understand how is Warren Buffett's name here in this book? 
So uh, I, I'm a huge Warren Buffett fan. I've always really appreciated value investing as, a, as an investor myself from about 10, 12 years ago. I've always been a fan of money and I've always thought that he approached it in such an interesting way. Um, uh, there's a book that you can buy that's a compendium of every one of his shareholder letters that he ever wrote, public knowledge, but it's all put into one, um, one spot. Fantastic reading completely technical in terms of how he talks about this stuff. So there's like 13, 1400 pages of like financial statements and narrative and all this kind of stuff. And I thought people in Web3, younger typically investors may not really like Warren Buffett or may not think that he's a really good person to look at as a as an investing paragon in the space, even though a thousand dollars invested in Warren Buffett in 1965 would have netted you thirty five million dollars in today's money. Uh, he's clearly done something right, growing at 20 percent compounded interest year over year for 60 plus years. So we thought, what if we could put Warren Buffett's investment wisdom into an easy to read because, young, I mean, people don't like to read. Uh, we could put it into like an easy to read digestible piece of content that was specifically speaking about investment in the Web3 space. So taking his investment wisdom and applying it to a place that really has no financial uh, guardrails or education or anything like that. And it was a really great project. I had read all of his investment letters. I had written a bunch of notes, it took me about six weeks to write and probably about three weeks to, or three months to like edit and get the designs and everything. But it's been met with a lot of really good fervor and, and excitement because people look at this who never really knew that Buffett was really involved in this or, or never really thought to apply his wisdom to the Web3 space. And the best part, the irony of all this, at the very end of the book, we talk about his $500 million investment in a South American bank called New Bank. And this was in 2021, I believe. And that bank has its own digital currency. That bank is focused in this space and, and part of it is focused in this space. So whether or not he likes it or whether or not he, you know, he called it rat poison squared, whether or not he likes it, he's he's exposed to and he's supporting a company that does it. And that, that stock was a two dollar stock and now it's an eight dollar stock. So I, I just love the fact that we were able to take two very conflicting ideologies and put them into something that's fun, easy to read and informative. Wonderful, wonderful. Sometimes you have worked in, uh, you know, big, big four other firms. You could be sitting pretty there. Sometimes does it occur to you, you know, why did I get into this space, take so much of risk when there was no need to take so much of risk? You could have been or yourself a passive investor, you know, if you were so bullish. Help us understand, does it occur or it has not? You know, it's, it's, a, great, it's a great question. I spent five or six years at these companies like trying to get senior leadership to be interested in blockchain technology. And this was in 2016, 2017, when like nobody really cared. They, they, they're like, oh, this is the blockchain guy. He's kind of weird. We're not going to really talk to him. Like go do the audit stuff or go, you know, go, go do the financial risk liquidity management that you do and all this stuff. And I, I just, I, I was born uh, in a time where I, you know, plug in, in the internet, mom, get off the phone. I want to use the internet. Um, and, and I grew up with computers and I grew up with this internet age of being able to get online and understand how to, how to engage with my friends. And, you know, there was a time when you would never think to put your birthday or your credit card on the internet. That was anathema. And yet here I am like, you want my social security number? You can have it. Like I have no money. What are you going to do with it? Right. Um, so th when I see this new revolution of how money is being used and about how people are able to participate in the digital economy, it makes me so excited. And, and I finally figured out that I have a passion and a place in this world. And that's to talk about this as a new dynamic way for people to participate in the digital economy. So um, I also have pretty much found as an entrepreneur that um, there's probably a good reason why I can't get hired. Like I, I it's not that big, like, I don't want to go work at big four. I just like, I don't want this corporate job where it's really tough to move the needle. I want to be able to kind of forge my own, uh, forge my own movement in that respect. Wonderful. Wonderful. It's nice to see, see in, in life, you never know what is going to be hundred percent, right? hundred percent right. wrong, but it is very important to take a stand and whatever it is, uh, stick to it, try it out, fail, 
if it if you have to and learn from it and move onwards and it is very nice to see young people taking those risks about things that they you know believe in and you still have time to make those amends as you go along the way nobody knows what's going to happen you can hit the jackpot you can you can learn out of it and maybe hit it hit the jackpot a bit later on with that learning such is life be that as it may there is much to learn from you matthew and so those people who want to learn from you about investing investing in uh, digital assets investing in anything else that is possible or the trends that you might see in the future about the book what is the best way for them to connect with you Absolutely. Uh, you can reach me at Matthew at block3strategy.io. Uh, you can check us out on our website, block3strategy.io. Uh, you can also reach out to me on Twitter uh, at block3strategy. And uh, I would just love any opportunity to engage with folks, even to answer questions, just be a guide, provide any sort of um, you know advice on, on how to approach the space, especially with folks trying to figure out custody. That's a big, big problem, right? I have to get a wallet, I have to have a password, all these kinds of things. And so from an NFT perspective or a digital asset perspective, we wanna make that easy for you. We wanna help train you and educate you on how you can do that safely, securely, manage your money, be your own bank. Don't worry about the intermediaries out there that could fail, you know, could could have a run on the bank or anything like that. You can do this yourself. And um, it's it's meant to be a democratized set of of a way that people can engage in, in finance. And so that means that you have to learn about it and you have to do it for yourself. But there's a lot of good tools out there and, and we just want to be able to help. So appreciate it. Absolutely. With this, it's a wrap on this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.